So thank you to those who are joining us today. This is the first in a series of live broadcasts brought to you by IPB and a number of uh, cooperating organizations. Today we have Code Pink with us, represented by Nancy Mancias, who is uh, live in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt uh, at the COP27. Uh, and we're very thankful to have you with us today, Nancy. I'm going to give the floor right over to you so you can uh, tell us a little bit about your impressions and experiences uh, during these opening days of the COP27. Thank you. Thank you, Sean and IPB for organizing um, this live stream. Um, this is Nancy Mencius, campaign organizer with Code Pink. And I am here in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt at the COP27. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe just give some comments about what I've witnessed and what I've heard, and then open it up for any questions. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the opening press conference. We heard from the new COP27 president talking about the um, how climate action is important and it's important to address it as a collective, um, addressing these challenges. Um, he says, we are at a point of no return for future generations. Yet during his opening remarks, did not mention one word of the Egyptian prisoners of conscience, some of them of a young age um, being held in prison. Uh, there is an importance um, this week of focusing on loss and damage. For those of you who don't know, loss and ja damage refers to the destructive impacts of climate change that cannot be avoided by mitiga mitigation or adaptation. Um, also during the opening press conference, we heard from Simon Steele, who is uh, the new, I believe, the new UN Executive Climate Secretary. And he urges that the world needs to come together on the crisis, creating a safe political space to address climate. There are areas of common ground and he's asking that all parties to come with ambition. And someone coined the, the term that this cop is the cop of ambition. He also warned, and this is where our work comes in, that emissions are not coming down. Mitigation needs to be increased to ensure we have a safer world. So um, how does that reflect on the work that we are doing when we talk about military emissions? He also emphasized the loss and damage is to be addressed for the most vulnerable countries to reach their climate goals. Now this issue of loss and damage, um, this is going to be dominating the agenda this week. Sorry if there's a delay, I'll try to slow down. The issue has been floating around for the past 30 plus years. And it's, an, it's finally an agenda item. So how do we in our work put emissions on the agenda? How do we specifically put military emissions on the COP agenda? Are we willing, are we up for the fight? It took loss and damage 30 years to get on the agenda. Are we willing to, to do this for the long haul to wait 30 years to put emissions, military emissions on the agenda. I also had the opportunity to attend a uh, conversation with um, a phil philanthropic organizations. Um, specifically, uh, one stood out to me was the Bezos Earth Fund. I believe that's Jeff Bezos Earth Fund. And the speaker, there's, there's a large amount of contradictions that are happening here. The speaker, Andrew Steer, he went on and championed the US and Canada doing these, these innovative uh, programs and work with First Nation indigenous people. But really we know deep down that that's bullshit. And that is absolute straight up brainwashing. 
if we look at the relationship between the U.S. and Canada, we can take the Line 3 pipeline as a good example. Enbridge, which is a tar sands oil company from Canada, received a contract from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to lay an oil pipeline underneath the Mississippi River, which is going to disrupt the wild rice harvesting that the indigenous people of Minnesota have been doing for years. So there is a disconnect between what people are saying um, and what is really happening on the ground uh, when it comes to indigenous people. And I really wanted to raise this point with him, but he, he was off the stage. And then I also had the other opportunity to um, attend a talk with the uh, former British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. <clears throat> now, as you can imagine, he's a, he's a personality, lots of energy, and was really just kind of a media circus. But he also talked about how Boston Damage is going to dominate the ag agenda and how the US, as well as other wealthy countries, are falling short on pledges. Um, Boris Johnson went ahead and he cheered on the US's policy um, in sending resources. Now we know what resources means to the Ukraine. That means military arms to, to the Ukraine. Now he is coming here on the spirit of Glasgow. He is still so high um, on what has happened in Glasgow for COP26 and wanted to be here as a supportive person and really just reflect on that time. I think maybe he just looks at that as, a, as, as something that he could really uh, reflect on as a former prime minister. Uh, another thing he talked about is uh, uh, when we talk about loss and damage, there are some who are asking for reparations for, for all. He's completely against that. He's just like, we just don't have the money <laughs> or something like that. But um, one thing I did want to raise uh, while Boris Johnson was speaking was the um, issue of Allah, um, and I'm going to mispronounce <clears throat> his name, Abdel Hatta, who is the British Egyptian writer, human rights defender that is in prison and is actually on a, um, a water fast right now as the COP27 is happening. I didn't have to raise the question. Uh, the, um, the interviewer raised it and Boris Johnson said that Ada needs to be free. And um, so that was a huge step. Um, so I posted the video of that um, on my Twitter account, if anyone is interested in seeing that, but the former British prime minister, it, Boris Johnson is calling for Allah Abdel Fattah to be free. Um, and he said that he's had discussions with um, a CC and with others in the Egyptian government uh, to work towards that. And he was doing this while he was at, while he, while he was prime minister. So um, I don't know what, what diplomatic conversations are happening now that Boris Johnson is not, is no longer in office. And um, I think that is all I have to say for my opening remarks in what I've uh, seen. Um, so yeah, I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, it's great to have you there and in person. I think uh, we'll start uh, from our end with uh, one or two questions and then we will definitely open it up to everyone who is attending uh, the Zoom meeting as well as those who are with us uh, on the Facebook live stream. Um, I think perhaps the, uh, the first question I would have from our end, uh, and this is just purely out of curiosity, but I'm wondering if you can show us a little bit around the space that you're in now and explain to us what is this space, how is it being used, uh, and uh, yeah, what are the plans for that space over the coming weeks? So 
sorry, Nancy, you're muted. Sorry about that. So the space that I'm in is called the Innovation Zone. And I believe this is put together by a, um, a British group. Um, and I'm not quite sure what they do, but they have um, hotspots. They have uh, complimentary Wi-Fi. Uh, they also have uh, these talks, like the talk I, I attended with Boris, Boris Johnson. So um, they are a British-based organization. And the thing that's interesting about COP um, I'm not sure if, for those of you, who, well, for those of you who have attended, you're familiar with the blue zone. And within the blue zone, there are side events. And then there's also the green zone hosted by, put together by the host country. This one's called the innovation zone. This is completely independent. I wanna call this the sideliners event. Um, so what's gonna happen here is going to be a, a week of talks um, a week of uh, workshops, an opportunity for people to set up their desks, set up hot, hot spots, um, their hot desks, use the Wi-Fi. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm coming back to this location. I do plan on going to the green zone, which is across the street from this uh, location. Uh, which is having a wars and climate justice workshop tomorrow. Uh, so that's pretty much what's happening in this space is the people who are independent outside of COP27. And this isn't just the only independent space. Just down the highway, Saudi Arabia is having their own, they're having their own um, parallel COP27 conference. Um, and that's kind of an issue of uh, trying to save the people and planet when you know we all know um, that they are uh, creating the most horrific human rights violations in, in Yemen. Um, so I hope that's answered your question. Absolutely, and thank you so much for that. Uh, my next question would be uh, just, with regards to the atmosphere uh, that you have felt over the past couple of days, um, if you've had the chance to speak to some other activists or uh, other attendees of the conference in general, specifically on the overlap between climate and militarism, and if, if you've seen if there's been much perception, if people are open to this idea, um, or if uh, really the focus is more on loss and damage or even other elements of climate change. Well, we are just at the beginnings of COP27. Um, so there are some events that are dealing with this issue um, that are in connection to COP27. Um, as you know, there are the side events inside of the blue zone that are taking place. Um, so to have the discussion, people are interested, um, but I think folks are really, they're, here with their own agendas. <laughs> um, but if anyone is willing to talk to me and listen to me, I am all ears. I mean, I'm, all, I'm here for them to talk about um, the issue. Now, I think it's, it's our work to continue pushing this issue. We've done so much. Like Glasgow COP26 was such a game changer for us. And I think that we could keep, continue to build on that and continue to build on what we've done here. Now, um, because people are so focused on their specific agendas and there isn't really, Sham al Sheikh isn't really an activist community unlike Glasgow, which has, you know, Scottish CND, which has been there for so many years. We don't really have that here, but I have had the opportunity to talk to the local folks, Egyptians, about what it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, having this conference in town. And what they're seeing is um, kind of a step up of security, um, more of a police presence. Um, I'd have to say, um, uh, like airport type check-in um, going into uh, the old town area. 
and they say, well, this is because of the conference. This is why this is all happening. So my sense is if this conference wasn't happening, there wouldn't be such a, a, a large police presence. Now, coming from the US, I think the US is such a police state. I think that this is normal. We have cops running the streets um, throughout our big cities. So, but for the local community, it's, it's not so much. Um, and I also have to say that going outside of, I had the opportunity to go outside of Sharm El Sheikh and that's an inco a completely different experience. Um, the city is surrounded by a wall, similar to the uh, Israeli apartheid wall. And there's only one way by land to come into the city and one way out. And that's through this checkpoint. But the city itself is a fortress. Um, so it, um, so outside the city, there, that's where I, I've seen the military. I, I took a, a trip up to Mount Sinai and that's where the military is basically outside the, the perimeter of Sharm El Sheikh, whereas the local police are, are inside just kind of directing traffic, uh, just having cop cars on the side people's bags um so yeah that that's what it's been like for for local folks great thank you so much nancy i think we will now open it up to the questions from our participants uh both via zoom and those who are participating uh online on our facebook live streams uh so those who are with us in zoom you can use the raise your hand feature uh, if you would like to ask the question yourself, or if you would like us to ask the question for you, you can write that in the chat, and then we will communicate that. Uh, for those online, you can just comment on the live stream, and we will be monitoring there as well for any questions. Yes, I see we have our first question coming from Theo. Go ahead. Uh, hello, Nancy. Thank you for, for helping us here for doing this broadcast. I am very interested in knowing, especially as you said, you've been in other COPs. Uh, how were your expectations for this first day, how they were met, and what are you seeing regarding this first day in this COP comparing to others? You've touched on the on the question about the uh, uh, the activist community comparing with Glasgow, but could you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, I would be happy to. So um, my um, it was a, a little daunting coming into um, into this COP twenty seven because I think what had happened in Glasgow was something special. And I don't know if we will ever have that um, energy and collective community uh, energy again. That's quite the opposite here. There's, there isn't that. Um, just to give you a sense, Sharm El Sheikh is a exclusive resort town uh, it's a place where um, folks from Eastern Europe, from Russia, even Southern Europe, Italy, come to vacation uh, where they may spend a month with their kids, just bathing in the Red Sea, snorkeling. So that's what Sharm El Sheikh is. It's, it's not a place of, um, it's not a, a hotbed of activism, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so my expectations were very low and I have to tell you that the low expectations have been met, um, being in kind of a sprawl, um, it, it, um, it's a desert town on a beach, uh, really difficult to get around in glass. People can just jump on the bus or the Metro and go off to an action or a meeting. Um, 
And here you just don't have that. There, there's a specific bus for the conference to take, um, to, to take people uh, to, the, to the different zones. But yeah, that's, that's been, um, yeah, just very low expectations. I don't wanna say it's, it's all that bad. I mean, it is a privilege to be here and to be able to connect with and have conversations and network with others to talk about military missions. Um, but yeah, I'm just reflecting that maybe I'm just like Boris Johnson saying that spirit of Glasgow. Um, it's just very, very different. Uh, I'm sorry, was there another point? Another point to your Perfect. question? That, 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 that touches it. Thank you so much. It, it was a good, it was a good response. Thank you. I see we have a hand up from Vaina next. Hello, hi Nancy. Great to see you in Sharm el Sheikh, and, you, and thank you for the description of Sharm el Sheikh. Yeah, I can absolutely underline that I was visiting Sharm el Sheikh. It's really a nice place for swimming and snorkeling, but it's definitely not a place for mass demonstrations. Independently, which government Egypt has, even the government makes it absolutely marvelous. You know, my question is related to the Ukrainian war. Is the Ukrainian war playing any role in the discussions? As not only by the questions of emissions, but mainly by the questions of cooperation or confrontation. Because you know, I personally cannot see any progress in the climate issue when we have this confrontational situation in the world. So this means negotiations for Ukraine are also a basic for more cooperation in other fields, including the climate field. Is this war playing any role as it is reflected in the discussions and is this atmosphere of the war this confrontational atmosphere also reflected in the whole conference up to now you know we are the first day but maybe you have the first impressions about that yeah um that's a really good question and the war in ukraine is uh something that is on people's mind and um just going back to to boris johnson who spent his time um on the mic just um uh saying talking about putin's bloody war and yes the the u.s is doing the right thing and sending resources to ukraine um, but yes, I, the, the Ukrainian war is, um, on, is uh, on, on people's mind, yet it is not front and center, loss and damage is, um, but I can say that there is a side event that is going to deal with military emissions, which does include members, um, uh, government officials from Ukraine. So they have a side event here at COP27. So even though the Ukraine war is not a front and center topic, it's not forgotten. Um, it's, it's not as if we are living in a box, although I think some people are living in a box when they come here, just being single issued climate change and not wanting to address human rights or war. Um, but yes, I think the Ukraine war is being framed in a way that it's Putin's bloody war. So if that helps in, in any way, if that answers your question. Thank you. Great. Uh, so just again to repeat, if anyone has uh, questions they would like to ask, you can uh, use the raise your hand function or send a message in the chat for those participating online. Uh, you can also uh, just comment on the post and we will be looking for replies there. Um, I'm not seeing any hands at the moment, but I will ask another micro question myself and we'll see if uh, any other questions arise in the meantime. I'm wondering, uh, Nancy, which events or uh, activities you are most looking forward to in the coming week during your time here? Uh, what events uh, give you some inspiration? Uh, which ones are most interesting? Uh, what will you be doing during your time there now? Well, I will mostly be in the green zone. Um, as I said, yes, uh, to it, tomorrow there is a workshop that is addressing war and uh, climate change. 
And this particular group, um, their name escapes me now, um, hopefully it'll come back to me, um, is dealing with issues of oppression, war, climate change. It, it, they really have a uh, transformative justice focus, um, looking at how people can be healed from these um, awful things, that, awful, the awful experiences of war, awful experiences of climate change. So that's how I will be spending my week. Um, also, if there's any other opportunities to attend um, speaking engagements like here in the innovation zone, um, I will definitely uh, take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, that's how I will be spending my week. Um, hopefully I can bring a banner out front of uh, COP27 co uh, Convention Center. There was a uh, Vegans for Peace. <laughs> they had a demonstration with some music and, and banners and dressed as animals. Um, so hopefully I bring the banner out and have it um, outside in front of the, the Convention Center. Great, thank you, Nancy. And uh, we look forward to hearing back on how all of that went uh, when we have our next conversation with Nancy on Saturday, the 12th of November. Uh, I see we have a hand up from Jacqueline. Yes, hi, thanks, Nancy. Um, I'm gonna be coming to COP27 from South Africa and we're working with some activists who are involved in a documentary series and I guess, you know, because of the context of Sharm El Sheikh being a resort and we're so far away from, um, I guess, uh, people on the ground who could be part of any mass sort of mobilization or mass sort of protest. I guess I'm just wondering, is there any space for that? Is there, um, is there an opportunity for any activists to gather and, and get together and, and protest? Because it feels like like you say, it's so different to Glasgow, but I feel like there are still going to be so many activists. And is there an opportunity for that? Or because of the, the, the context of the government, it won't be allowed? I guess I'm just trying to understand. Thank you. Well, demonstrations can happen inside the Blue Zone, uh, given that it is the... Hold on one second. Yeah, anyway, I don't know what that was. Someone was just flagging me. Anyway, um, so given that um, the UN uh, COP27 um, conference is uh, is part of the UN, uh, the UN people can, can protest inside of the convention center. So I can tell you that uh, Greenpeace plans to have a blue wave but that protest, flood the cop, I think it's called, but that's going to be inside of, um, of the blue zone, not necessarily outside. Um, and um, there is the COP27 coalition and they were planning to um, set up a climate justice hub at a local hotel, but that doesn't, to have been materialized. Um, that was supposed to be a place for activists to come together in Sharm El Sheikh who were flying in. Um, but I have yet to have seen that and that would have been a place for us to get together and have discussion and, and organize. But we'll see if it happens. I mean, it's day one of COP27. Maybe it'll happen uh, during the second week, but I have not seen it, and it's it's led by a local Egypt, Egyptian activist. So, yeah, uh, but a lot of actions inside, but really nothing um, outside. Great, thank you, Nancy. Um, I'll just read out. We have a comment from Marla Slavner in the chat. Uh, if anyone is hosting an event at COP27, that you know of and would <clears throat> like to screen a three to five minute trailer of Tasha's film, 1.5 Degrees of Peace, please let them know and the email is posted there as well. Uh, I have to say I've seen a trailer for the movie, I, uh, for the documentary, I have not seen the whole thing, but it's very inspiring uh, and, and quite wonderful. So uh, happy to include that here as well. 
I'm wondering if we have any more questions uh, someone would like to ask, either writing in the chat or raising a hand. <clears throat> I'm also, we're checking our Facebook page. Uh, there are no comments on there at this point. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we will see. I'm trying to think uh, in terms from our end, uh, maybe one other matter that we could mention. Uh, and this, I know, Nancy, you, you've referred to a little bit before, but uh, we had a lot of discussions in our working group on militarism and climate change uh, about the human rights situation and how to engage properly with COP27. In regards to that, uh, I'm wondering if there is a, a presence of some uh, Egyptian activists, climate activists on the ground, uh, if there, if it really is more of just an international gathering or uh, if, if there's much in relation to the local activists. Well, Sharm El Sheikh right now present, presently feels more like an international gathering, like we've kind of <laughs> invaded the local people's space. Um, I understand that there are uh, the activists uh, on the ground in Cairo who will be having a conference um, after COP27 for civil society, Egyptian civil society to get together. Um, I don't see that happening right now. Um, I do know that there are some side events um, in the blue zone that are addressing human rights, but to what extent that it's going to address the prisoners of conscience, I don't know. Um, and well, like I said, we'll just have to wait and see if the COP27 coalition uh, hub, climate justice hub, will materialize. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it seems there are no more questions for now. I know this is sort of our introductory session. So with COP just beginning, uh, there may not be as much uh, to ask about now as we see some of the developments in the coming days. Uh, but as uh, I was mentioning before, uh, Nancy will be with us again this coming Saturday, the 12th of November. And the time for that would be uh, 6 p.m. Egyptian time, which is 5 p.m. in, uh, oh, I think we might have lost Nancy here. Nancy, are you still with us? Okay, well, we it seems we may have lost Nancy, but she will be with us again then uh, on the 12th, 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, that's 11 a.m. on the east coast of the U.S. and then 8 a.m. on the west coast of the U.S. Uh, I'm sure Nancy will also be posting on her Twitter page uh, all of the updates about what is going on. So make sure that you follow Nancy and her journey throughout the COP, as well as Code Pink, her organization, uh, who is doing some great work. Uh, so we thank you for being with us and providing us insights uh, from OnSites and look forward to hearing updates on how everything is going. It is worth mentioning uh, IPB currently has uh, four scheduled events uh, of these broadcasts in COP. So we do have one this coming Wednesday, the 9th. Uh, that one will take place at, uh, let me just confirm the time there. Does anyone have that on hand? Uh, excuse me, the 9th is at 4 p.m. Central European time, which is 10 a.m. on the East Coast of the U.S. Uh, and then we will also have a session on Tuesday, the 15th of November uh, at 1 p.m. Central European time. And each of those have certain themes uh, that will be brought into the picture. Uh, you can find more information at www.ipb.org. And we hope to see you there. Thanks again, Nancy. And we wish you all the best for your time in Cup.